All right, and welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Governor's Summit on Early Language and Literacy session on collective impact and equity as a na navigational tool to achieve success in early childhood care and education. I am Cheryl Cooper Smith, and I am the program assistant at the Deal Center. I will be assisting the presenter for today's session. A few housekeeping things just to get us started. We encourage you to use the chat box to ask questions and share comments. Any burning questions for the presenter will address, we will address throughout the session. If time allows, at the end, we will also take questions for the presenter during the Q&A. Participant handouts for this presentation are available in the auditorium if you did not get a chance to access them, but they are located below the link and the session description, just below the information on the presenter, as well as we have placed a copy in the chat box if you would like to download that information. If, if you have any technical difficulties, please use the drop down menu in the chat box to uh, send that question or concern to me directly and I will respond as quickly as possible. Please remain muted throughout the session. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Mr. Junius Williams. Mr. Williams is the principal of Junius Williams Consulting Inc. And he is currently a senior advisor to the Collective Impact Forum. Welcome, Mr. Williams. I am going to stop sharing, Mr. Williams, so that you can begin sharing your presentation. And I want to verify, Cheryl, my screen is up. Your screen is up and we can see everything clearly. Okay. Um, good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to the session uh, this morning. Let me start by thanking Cheryl uh, for working with me to coordinate the, um, uh, the presentation today. Um, I have had the opportunity uh, over uh, the past couple of years to work with the folks at Deal uh, uh, Center. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment because I, I think it's a relevant context to what I, I wanna say. But I wanna start a little more broadly because we are at a, a really critical time um, in this nation as we come out of the pandemic, uh, the racial reckoning, uh, the dislocation, uh, in the economy. And it is a critical time for people anywhere uh, in the caring economy. And it's being popularized right now, but you know well what the caring economy is. Educators have been a core uh, component of the caring uh, economy uh, within this nation. And what is critical now is that we have the president talking about the caring economy and how essential it is that we get it organized and supported in a way that's going to produce uh, the results. And let me say a couple of other things. This is also about principles and values that if we don't take care of our children where they get a good start, there's no way that they're going to have a good finish. And we know that literally from if as literal as a race, a foot race, if you don't get started right, you don't end right. So one of the things around getting started right, I want to say, and this has been a consistent theme in my work over the 30 to 40 years I've been involved in education, is that we've got to pay people in education properly. They, we have severely underfunded and undersupported, not just the educational enterprise written large, but the people who do the work. 
they are underpaid severely. So as we talk about the caring economy, I wanna see us make a commitment to the economic prosperity of the people who care for our children, be it health, be it education, who care for us when we're ill, who care for us when we're elderly. If we don't get this right, we don't have the proper infrastructure to be a sustainable economy. And I'm gonna come back to that theme because if we don't get this right, it's not just a philosophical matter. This is a matter about national security and economic survival. And I'll show you some data which, which, uh, which uh, addresses that point. This is a great time then for us to think about how is it that we get all of the actors together who have a stake in the Karen economy and in your context specifically in the early care and education of our children, how do we get all of the actors involved in that reorganized in a way that we can produce the kind of results that we need to early on in children's lives that we know carries through their entire existence and lays the foundation for them to be healthy, productive, contributing members of our society. You have in your materials a very detailed slide deck. Don't get intimidated. I always produce and provide more slides than I actually deal with in detail, but I want people to have a tool if you are really interested to go back and to have enough of the content where you can figure out if there's something out of this that is useful uh, to you. In addition to that, as Cheryl mentioned, uh, I've provided a couple of other uh, slide decks that pro provide more detailed information around what is a central issue in all of the work that we're trying to do, no matter where it is uh, uh, in America, and it's an issue of equity. We got to get equity right to get anything else we're trying to do right. And that's why I provided uh, some supplemental materials on that. Um, I'm going to jump right ahead. And one of the things I want to know is to just get a feel about who's there. So we want to quickly do a couple of polling questions and Cheryl will populate a poll. The first thing I wanna know is what kind of work are you involved in uh, your organization's work? So I kind of have a sense there. So if you'd respond to this first poll, uh, what's your organization's work? And go ahead and uh, start. Uh... Yes, we have the, the poll up. Yeah. And you may go ahead and respond to the poll. Okay. Yeah, I see some responses are starting. Okay. Thank you for your participation. Yeah. This is okay. looking great. Okay. Fantastic, they're coming in, Mr. Williams. Yeah, I'm seeing them here. And nonprofit services and early childhood ed seem to be the uh, two most prevalent categories there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. But a significant well, number of folks from government. Excuse me, I apologize. I said, we'll end in a second so you can see the full results. Yeah, that's all right. I can do them on the fly here. They're not okay. gonna change much. Okay, yeah. So you can all see those as well. K-12 ed, uh, early childhood ed, uh, nonprofit services and government. I see we do have at least one uh, business person and uh, nobody from uh, philanthropy. Okay, that's good. We can move to the second question. <clears throat> Next, I wanna know a little bit about how much do you know about collective impact approach? <clears throat> okay, and let's move to the next question. Hold on, I'll move you to the next question. All right. This, I'm still seeing the first question. Uh, people are replying to the second question.
when when I share, you'll be able to see it. It may not be sharing correctly right now. Okay, so here we have. And here is our second results. I'm gonna share the results. Here we go. Uh, mine is still showing the first polling question, so. Is it? Okay. Yeah, and I never displayed on the second one. Let's do this. Let's just go ahead uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, well, can I, would you mind if I read off some of what I'm, I can view? If you can see something, I can't, I still yeah. see the first. So knowledge about the collective impact, we have about 20% who said, I know nothing about collective impact. 60%, I have a little familiarity with collective impact. And then we have 20% of the group that says, I have a lot, I know a lot about it since I worked with a backbone organization. So we have a range here. Okay, already, thank you. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get started. What I want to do is to quickly give you sort of the basics of the collective impact approach or framework. We hesitate to call it a model. Those of you who have done any sort of clinical work, when you start talking about models, you get into the fidelity of the model and you have to have a certain amount of precision in implementing the, the, the model to produce the, the anticipated results. This is a framework that, and you have to understand the origins of the collective impact framework. The folks at FSG, the authors, went around and basically asked the question, what conditions exist when people have a, been able to make uh, population level change, not just a program with 100 kids or uh, participants, but when we're talking about moving the needle for thousands of folks, and what they observed around the world ended up being the collective impact framework, that there were consistent patterns of people engaged in practices related to these conditions. And that's what became the basis of the model. But one of the things that's really important, and I'll say this repeatedly, and the authors themselves uh, say, is that you got to blend that with the local context where you have you have expertise in knowing whether or not things are going to work with the folks that you know best in your community. And what I and other folks say is that if it ain't feeling right for you and your community, then you probably don't want to do it because that instinct needs to be blended with um, uh, blended with what we know from uh, the framework of the model. But really quickly, I want to just give you a, a basic introduction to the model. And I want to start uh, with this uh, graphic that there are different types of problems. There are simple problems, complicated and complex. A simple problem is something like baking a cake. And the way that we overcome that is that we have recipes and it's a relatively simple problem if you follow the recipe. A little more complicated is sending someone uh, on a rocket to the moon really complicated, but it's really about science and mathematics. It's about physics. It's about geometry and calculus. So there's a real precision there. It is formulaic in a sense. And, but there are also complex problems like raising a kid. And you all know this better than anyone. No matter how much education, no matter how many books you've read, and a complex problem where there's a human dynamic to it, it is complex and um, and really a fluid situation. Those are complex problems. The point is, in the social sector, what we tried to do is to treat every problem as simple or complicated, and therefore we haven't been able to solve very complex social problems. And that's been manifested in the way that funders work. We fund individual grantees. We have them working separately and competitively. They're often disconnected from government or, or the business sector. We evaluate and isolate that particular program that that organization did. And then when we want to scale stuff, we talk about scaling an organization. And one of the things is that that does not work on complex social uh, problems. 
and it leads to an isolated impact. Oakland is a classic example. We've got one good program that's very effective on almost every social problem known to folks. And we have been ineffective in scaling them up. And that suggests that there's something else going on. And that gets to the fact that some of these problems are structural and systemic. And one single organization cannot solve them. They require people from different sectors to come together. And that's how we ended up in collective impact. There are a lot of different models out there and approaches for how people collaborate. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I would simply make the point that there are different approaches to collaboration and you need to be careful to select the one that is appropriate for the problem that you're trying to solve. And collective impact is not always the right solution. Sometimes a network, a coalition, an alliance, a, a partnership. So I want people to be careful and not just jumping into this because it's popularized right now. There are other approaches. And here's some examples of different sort of collaborative approaches. Um, and I'm not gonna go through this slide. I wanna focus on collective impact. Here's a really standard definition of what collective impact is. It's a uh, long-term commitment, and I underscore that. We're dealing with some problems that are intergenerationally, so we need to make long-term commitments to solving them. Second element is you need to bring different sectors together. We cannot work in isolation. So the problems and issues in education cannot be solved in education alone, and educators know that. Kids have health issues. Kids have food security issues. They have housing issues. And if you're going to really solve, you need people who can work on those different problems at the table. So different sectors, people need to agree on what the common agenda is. What is the problem you're trying to solve for and to be specific and analytic and organizing people around understanding that problem. And then you want to have a specific social problem. I know there are a thousand problems out there we can solve, but when you get too expansive, you lose the focus that we really need around high school graduation or entry of kids into uh, early childhood education programs. We need to be very specific on what we're trying to do as we rally the forces uh, of the community around problem. And finally, it's an issue of scale. A hundred kids in that program may have been great, but when we got 10,000 kids with that problem and that need, it's a drop in the bucket. We've got to get the scale on these social problems. So that's what collective impact is. I wanna say really a quick point about stakeholders and sectors. I don't like the sector language because we tend to devolve into thinking about sectors of the economy. No, I prefer stakeholders, people who have and interest one way or another in the outcome of the problem I consider stakeholders. And typical stakeholder groups are government, our philanthropy, our for-profit businesses, our community-based organizations, and finally their residents. They are people who are impacted by the problem we're trying to solve. And it's critically important that representatives from all of those stakeholder groups and probably more in a given community are thought about and brought into uh, the process of uh, problem solving. Um, so here's the, the core um, elements of the collective impact approach. Five patterns or conditions or elements that uh, Kanya and Kramer saw around successful uh, interventions and social problems. The first is the common agenda a common understanding of the problem that usually involve problem definition and root cause analysis. It's looking at data, it's looking at literature. Uh, it's a comprehensive common understanding of this is what the problem is uh, so that when you get to the strategy stage, you can be focused. And then it's rallying people around a shared vision for change around that problem. The second element is shared measurement. That is, people have to agree on how you're going to document the problem and how you're going to document uh, and assess and measure whether or not you're achieving progress 
uh, on the outcomes that you've identified for yourself. There's a real focus on performance management. We're doing various strategies and interventions to solve the problem. Are they working? Very rigorous evaluation of that so that we have data to know what's working and not working so that we can learn and get into a cycle of continuous improvement. There's also got to be shared accountability, which is all of this are working on this together. So if something ain't right, it's not that program providers problem, it's all of our problem to solve. And it's all of our responsibility that it didn't work well. So this notion around we all own this and every tentacle of what we pulled together in this collective impact initiative. Mutually reinforcing activities is once you've sort of done the problem analysis and you've identified some critical strategies and intervention, there's work to be done with all of the things that are already going on in the community. Now, ideally, you would have had representatives from all of those folks who are already working on the problem at the table that you constructed to work on it. But the other part of this is for people to be able to begin to see how what they do aligns with your strategy and your vision for change uh, on uh, the problem so that their individual activities begin to, to get contextualized. Quick example of that. If we're trying to improve uh, uh, third grade, uh, third grade uh, reading scores uh, of kids, and we've now decided, as you've done in your work, that there are these critical actions and stuff to do in the community and some stuff to do with parents and professional development, and you've got those. And then you've got after school providers, for example. And they're saying, well, we don't do direct instruction. We don't do that. What they begin to see, and if you've done the right problem analysis, that you know that there's a correlation between kids' attendance and academic performance. So you help the people in the after school program to understand that there's years of data which suggests that kids who go to after school programs have higher levels of attendance. So those folks begin to see how their work aligns with what you're doing. And even though it's a differentiated approach that they're trying to care for kids after school, do some academic support, the very fact that they exist and the kids participate increases the likelihood that kids are going to attend regularly and regular attendance is correlated with better academic performance. So that's what you want to have happen. Let me make one other point really quickly, and people don't like this part of it. But sometimes this process means that we cannot explain why a particular organization is doing a particular line of work and there's no evidence that it's effective and it doesn't align. Those are some hard conversations to have with organizations. And we've typically avoided that and let them die on the vine. And what collective impact allows us to do is to start asking people uh, critical questions about how effective their work is and how it aligns and I would hope supporting them and figuring out a way that they might retool and realign what they do so that it's supporting. So I always on this, they're going to be casualties because when you start looking critically at the data and you have a sense about what really needs to be accomplished to achieve your outcome, we got a lot of stuff that we probably shouldn't be doing. And I don't want to blame it on all of those typically smaller nonprofits, sometimes big institutions, but you need to give people the support and the room to change. Okay, maybe I shouldn't be doing that, but help me find out, given my skill set, what I can do to contribute to this goal, this outcome that we support. The fourth element is continuous communications. And there are a couple of things going on here that are really important in collective impact. One is that you're building some collaborative infrastructure. So you've got to have good communication tools to communicate to all of these stakeholders across different organizations. So there's, there's effective uh, and continuous communication with folks. And that helps to build trust. People know what's going on, know what they fit. The other part of communications is equally important. When we discover what really works and we want to get to scale, we're going to need to go to the community 
and share with them the need to expand and bring to scale the work that we've been doing. So having continuous communication with the general public and building public support is good because when you hit that goal and you say, we got a couple things here that every kid should have or that every community, you're gonna need to be able to go to the public and say, we need the resources and support to do that. And then finally, there's this notion about having a backbone support organization, dedicated staff who is managing and supporting the collaboration. For years, we suffered through a notion that you got to, uh, that you've got to collaborate and funders just said, oh, you have to collaborate. They gave us no money, no resource, no structure, and we all got strained because collaboration isn't free. It's labor intensive. You need dedicated staff. You need to be people who are the creative engines for the work we want to do, not to be worried about uh, the staff support. A quick example, all of us have been in this long enough that we know when we're in collaboratives that are not supported, we have a good idea and we say, well, the culture of this group is if you raise a good idea, you get assigned to do that. And I already got three jobs. I don't need another job. What it does is it stifles creativity in collaborations. If you have no support and everything is suggested, you got to do. So this relieves people of that and you can see it when people have a support structure, the creativity level goes up. People think outside of the box. They're willing to do things because they're supported by dedicated staff who can flesh out things and help the group to decide if it's something they want to do. So that's the basics of the collective impact approach, a common agenda, shared measurement, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication, and backbone support. So what this model does is it moves from this isolated uh, impact that I talked about before to the interaction of many organizations trying to solve the problem, that the same goal and measuring the same things is occurring. There's cross-sector and cross-stakeholder group alignment and learning that government and corporate partners are brought to the table and that organizations actively coordinate. One of the things though that we noted, and I'm gonna go a little bit differently. My critique of the approach, and I work with the authors and stuff, is it's missing three critical things from my experience. I've been doing collaborative management for over 25 years before it even got called Collective Impact. We were doing it at Urban Strategies Council uh, in Open. Three things are missing. Stakeholder and community engagement are absolutely critical if you're going to change social problems. There needs to be a real focus, a centrality on equity in the collaboration process and in the interventions that people are employing. And you've got to redistribute and share power in ways that we haven't heretofore. And these are missing. The authors and I have had a 10-year conversation. In fact, we're co-authoring uh, a piece in the fall, uh, a 10-year revisit to collective impact to emphasize that they miss some things and the practitioners are having most success realize you've got to have these things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. You have in my deck three slides that talk more about stakeholder, about each of these three, but I want to spend a moment talking about equity because equity is the one that is going to make or break us in uh, American uh, culture. So I'm going to jump ahead. And I want to talk a little bit about why equity is important in early childhood health and learning. Uh, I always quiver about whether to try to convince people that we need to do things versus just telling them if you're convinced. But let me try to say a few things. For people in Georgia, equity is important because of this. Do you see this graphic and what it's telling us is that the population of white folks in the state of Georgia since 1980 has dropped from 72% to uh, right now, uh, it's about 51 and it's projected by 2050 to be 38. And that population change is people of color. If we fail kids of color, 
We failed ourselves, we failed our economy, we failed our democracy. That is compelling evidence that we need to do something about equity in this country uh, because this pattern and when you correlate it with data about low economic attainment, low educational attainment, it is a formula for economic and democratic failure. And people need to recognize that we got to do a better job at equity or we're going to lose all that, that we value. We also know, and we've known for so long, it drives me crazy about what the investment in early childhood yields. A straight ROI, return on investment analysis, says this is the best investment we can make in almost anything government spends on. And we've got better evidence on it, and yet we've never fully funded early childhood education. We know that it roughly delivers $8.60 for every dollar of investment. Few things give you 800% return on your investment. We also know that there are increased parental earnings and employment, there's higher educational attainment and decreased racial, racial and economic gaps for kids who have had quality childhood experience, they have higher lifetime earnings, they have lower remediation costs, and they've got reduced criminal justice. Why ain't we fully funded? It is a simple equation. The data have been there and we've known some of this data since the 1960s. It is scandalous. We got to do this. Our survival is based on a solid foundation for our kids and the early childhood education and care movement represents that. And we've got we've got good bones in the structure. We just need to put meat on that bone. So I'm gonna spend just a quick minute talking about equity. And when I do equity, and I'm not gonna go all through all of these in detail, but it's important that you define what equity is and some related terms like intersectionality, like diversity and inclusion, so that everybody can engage in a conversation on this on common grounds. You've got to focus on the structural and systemic. Equity ain't about blaming and finding and blaming some individual racist. That exists, but that's not really what's driving our problems in America. It is structural and it's systemic, and I know that that's politically charged, but it is the reality. Structures produce systems and systems effectuate results. There are forms of equity implementation. Let me really quickly, Definitions, I'm not going to go through these. Here are a couple of definitions. There are a lot that are floating out there uh, of these key terms. Here are some that I use in my work. Um, but almost all of the definitions talk about fairness and justice uh, as a foundation for thinking about equity. My definition from my former organization is a little more uh, proactive. I'm talking about systematically finding where there are disparities, different outcomes or access to opportunity for different groups of folks. And in my work, I don't care who they are. When I go in and start, I want the best of the data. I wanna look at rural and urban. I wanna look at age range. I wanna look at race and ethnicity. I wanna look at veteran status. I wanna look at LGBTQ. I wanna know who are we doing well for and who are we doing poorly for, because that's the foundation of my equity work. I wanna know where there are disparities and I wanna to get together with people who are experiencing disparities and the experts locally and figure out what are we gonna to do to reduce or eliminate the disparity that some group is experiencing. So that's my model uh, again. And I have in the other de definitions of those other terms I mentioned, there's an equity uh, primer deck in the materials and it has a lot of other definitions. But here's one I wanna spend a moment for. Most of you have seen this. I wanna to explain to you my interpretation of what this chart or this graphic means. The first is our structural or, or our inequality that everybody in trying to treat them equally, it doesn't treat folks equally because of what people come to the table with. In the second image, what we've tried to do is to apply some intervention that attempts to um, provide some relief to the problem. What the third one does is the most important. 
because the third one reflects what we need to be doing. When we encounter problems reflected in the first one, we need to ask a structural question. We've got a structure there. Is that structure necessary? So baseball is a great one. When we analyze a structure in baseball, what do you conclude? We do need a fence, right, of some sort, because the most exciting play in the game of baseball is a home run, right? And the way that that's demarcated is that fence. So, okay, we need a fence. But when you start doing the, the analysis to say, okay, we need a fence, but do we need a fence that blocks the view of some folks? No, we can have a chain link fence, right? So do you see where I'm going? It's that structural inquiry, structural analysis, and structural remediation that's going to get us there. And that's why I focus on structural and systemic change. And that's what we need to be doing in collective impact and more generally in our equity work. Oh, geez, uh, I'm really behind. Let me do this. Uh, I'm going to just scan through a couple of more slides, and I'm going to throw it open uh, for questions. Um, Here's a slide that's relatively new. I hear so many people talking about they've adopted the data lens and they're doing data uh, or equity lens and looking at the data through that, or they've adopted a principle and a value statement. As important as those things are, they're just entering the work to be able to look at stuff. And I will be blunt with you. People of color and women have a built in equity lens because they have been subjected to discrimination and their lens for looking at that as a part of the explanation of what's happening is ingrained. I appreciate the fact that a lot of other people are now discovering that disaggregating data and looking at race and gender and other dimensions of difference is important. Uh, so I'll give you some credit for that, but you just sort of getting your feet wet. That's baby stuff. Principle and value talk is cheap. After the Black Lives Movement matter, hundreds and thousands of organizations adopted principle and value statements and didn't do a single thing differently. That is not persuasive. Useful, but insufficient to get us there. The real work is in what are your strategies and interventions that you're employing and how do they reflect equity? What are your policy positions around equity and have you made equitable relief part of the outcomes of your work. When you start doing that, you get to the North Star where everything in the organization is through that theme and prism of we're going to achieve equity. An important framework because here are the things that people need to be doing on the work for collective impact really quickly, you can focus on the interventions and equity in the interventions. You're building a collaborative. You need to focus some attention on equity around the collaborative. You've got a backbone support organization. How are they practicing equity? And you've got one to a hundred other partners. What are they doing for equity? You need to be working on them all, but you need to prioritize because and sequence because it's hard. When you're building this mothership of collaboration and you're trying to figure out how you're gonna attack this big problem, you've got already limited capacity and stuff. So you need to be careful about not overextending. I'm gonna skip through these. Let me do this final uh, slide. The typical then structure that people have for working on collective impact looks something like this. You have some steering committee uh, of people who do strategic guidance and support. You have a backbone support. The real work is over here if you set it up right. You've pulled together people with uh, direct experience with the problem, direct in, uh, uh, expertise, service providers, people with lived experience. You have to devolve the decision making to those folks who know the most about the problem because they probably know the most about solutions. This is not a hierarchical structure where the people over here decide everything. If you're working right, these working groups that are around your strategies or around what, however you defined it, form the ecosystem and that's where the hard work gets done in this model. Um, uh, again, here's just, I'm gonna stop, uh, let me see. Yeah, let me stop here. Uh, here is just a, a sample of the range of problems that people have effectively used this approach. 
Cradle to Career, there's a huge Strive uh, Together initiative, a national initiative, Cradle to Career uh, education support uh, that's in 70 communities around the country. And as you can see, they are producing and documenting real results at every level from the preschool to the third grade reading to the eighth grade math to the high school graduation to the post-secondary enrollment and completion rates. It's been used on workforce development, on juvenile justice reform, on um, youth uh, uh, substance abuse, a wide range. Let me stop and throw it open questions of saying this. What, one of the things that we've learned from the pandemic is, is around the so-called frontline workers. Uh, and I think one of the things that's really important to think about and that we learned is that when schools shut down and child care centers shut down, it had a direct impact on parents who then could not go to work that had a direct impact on businesses. Business needs to be at this table. Business needs to be supporting this, not only ideologically, but they need to be supporting this financially. Our education system, among one of its greatest products is people to be employed by business and industry. They've got an interest, they should be investing, they should be supporting, not just giving money, they should be at the table helping us to plan how do we get early childhood education and care right so it benefits uh, everyone. And I think that collective impact is a good approach uh, to bring business along with education, along with community stakeholders and the providers uh, to get this right and to figure out how we care for our kids early and well so that they can take care of us late and well in terms of uh, our social security and later in life service needs. So I'm gonna stop at this point and throw it open to questions. Sorry, I got a little behind, a lot behind. Floor is open. Do you have any things coming in already, Cheryl? Start or yes, I, I had lots of agreement um, from the audience. Um, Erin, um, she is in strong agreement, especially around the um, the five elements. She said she was nodding vigorously. Um, Zoe said yes. Change happens at the speed of trust. So we don't have a, a lot of questions, but we have lots of agreement. They love, the group loves your passion. Well, um, let's just open it up for either comments, unmike yourself, comments or questions. Let's use the remainder of that time interactively. How can you see if you, um, from what you heard, how do you all see this possibly fitting in to what you are currently doing or even considering bringing this to some of the work that you might be doing in your communities and organizations. Any thoughts around that? Yeah. One of the things that I said I was gonna mention and I didn't, I'll come back, is that the Deal Center for a couple of years did a pilot with several sites around the state supporting uh, them in trying to deploy uh, uh, this uh, approach. So there have been several, I can't remember if it was six or eight at this point, but communities that did do an exploration of using the, uh, this approach. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, those communities as well as the deal center. There has been some work and more broadly, the Georgia Reads campaign was built on a collective impact model. It's a, harder to do it on a big statewide level, but they have used many of the tenets uh, uh, of the collective impact approach in the way that they've organized Georgia Reads. So sorry for that intervention, but I wanted to just acknowledge that that is going on. Back to Cheryl's question. Wonderful. Correct. Many of uh, we have like five, and then we've added an additional five who are engaging in the collective impact approach. So, and several of those folks are on um, in our audience as well. Um, Rachel says, I, I currently do this work across my region. The goal, the goal is to bring the business community in to help them under, help with understanding their role 
in early childhood education. So like Rachel is saying, everyone has a role. Um, she said it is working when business leaders get it. The pandemic, the pandemic has helped. Okay. Has really helped with this to bring that understanding and awareness to them. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing. Anyone else? Comments, questions, critiques? I accept them all. Um, we, from PRLSK, -R uh, McDaniel, um, they said, I love the vigor in your voice. Shout it from the rooftops. There was, um, we had um, another person who said that they love the point um, of the baseball field it was an excellent visual to explain equity. Okay. Do we have any other additional questions or thoughts? Okay, thank you. Oh, here is one that just popped up. I am a member of a team that has been put together to develop an EDI initiative. EDI? Hmm. Uh, oh, some stuff is popping up in DeKalb yeah. County. How can CI be used? I don't know what EDI is. Can somebody tell me what EDI is? Economic development. She may come back and 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 okay. Hear some additional ideas on it. Okay, uh, I'm going to go to the next one there for a moment to address the elephant in the room. Conversations about equity can often be controversial in our state. I would like to hear your thoughts about how we frame this work as necessary for everyone, not taking uh, from one to give to another. Um, well, a couple of things. Uh, and I didn't go on the slides, but I'll say them now. Do you recall during uh, the Russian intrusion uh, in 2016 and 2020, if you look carefully at the data, you know one of the biggest stra strands of their work was trying to leverage racial divides in this country uh, as a source of further dividing us. So from a national, uh, a national security perspective, it's a vulnerability for us to be so racially uh, divided and it's a, a point of intrusion for, for other folks. There's also an economic argument. Let me just be honest. Uh, and I know it doesn't sell, settle well with some people you cannot have the pattern that we've had of extraction of wealth, of labor, of so many things for so many groups of people, and then just declare everything equal and move on. There's gotta be, and this is me, others disagree, there's gotta be some redistribution. I am sorry, Jeff Bezos does not need $170 billion. And if we've got a system that lets him accumulate that much wealth, it is basically a problem structurally that we let him do that. And let's go to the heart of this. Jeff Bezos is here and not in South Africa, exploiting this economy and exploiting our infrastructure. We all paid for the infrastructure that Jeff Bezos is using in order to accumulate an obscene level of wealth. So my personal position is, no, there's got to be some redistribution. I, I, he, I do not begrudge him his billions, but I begrudge him not paying his workers sufficiently and exploiting their labor to accumulate that wealth. So my position is, no, race, this conversation is hard because there's some reckoning that needs to happen when you extracted the wealth and the labor from various groups of people and you can't just declare it all fair and equal and move forward because you embed then the disparities that were created by that bad behavior in perpetuity for those people who have been subjected to it. So yeah, it's a hard conversation, but we better have it because other folks around the world are having it and how to use it against us. Enough said. Okay, we have another question. We, I wanted to go back um, 
Mr. Williams, to the question that you had around um, from Teresa, she said, I am a member of the team that has put together. Right, I recall it. What's the EDI is the only thing. I is Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Inclusion Initiative for the DeKalb Public Library. Um, how can collective impact be used to develop this initiative? Um, so it may not be a collective impact task. And that's where I started with is that you got to be sure that you've got the right tool for your problem. For me, what a, a, a particular like a county library would do is you need to do a, um, an equity organizational assessment that you need to be within the organization. This is not at first flush a uh, inter-organizational issue. So there are some tools and one of the uh, decks that uh, I gave you has some uh, mention and some uh, citations. And if not, I can follow up with Cheryl on some organizational assessment tools. So I don't know a lot about it, but my initial thing, if it's within your organization, no, you wanna start with an organizational equity assessment and where you're looking at personnel, at values, at principles, uh, at what your relationships are with the community, about policy and practices, about your procurement, about your employment. How are you managing equity within that public library organization? So I would not go to a collective impact model for that process. Okay. And Cheryl, I'll send you my bibliography on equity impact analysis tools, on organizational assessment tools, um, equity tools. I've got a bibliography that will that I'll, I'll send to Cheryl and she can add to the materials for you. Let's see. We have another question or statement at least here from Zoe. Um, it's important to remember also that there is a Georgia Family Connection Collaborative in every county in our state that is practicing collab collaboration slash collective impact. They are great networks and resources. So we have this going on right in our own backyards. Yeah. Thanks for the reminder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The, the other point what I would make is don't think you got to create something new. If something already exists, go in and make it better. We have a penchant here for wanting our own things. That's why I typically don't invite politicians to tables that I work with, because they're running for election. I'll bring the bureaucrats, the head of health and human services. Yeah, I'll bring him or her to the table. I don't want electeds. Uh, they tend to skew things in ways that are, are, not, uh, are not helpful. And, and they also want to create their own things. I spent five years on a boys and men of color initiative where we had everybody at the tables working well. President Obama came along with my brother's keeper and the mayor decided she needed her own table. Wasted five years of work, went over and did the stuff, not even as well as we did before, redid the stuff and it, it faded away. So be careful about being strategic. If there's something there, See if you can work with it, help to buttress and strengthen it. Don't think you got to change something new. And as you know well in Georgia, beware of politicians' participation in these things. Well, Mr. Williams, thank you so much for such a clear and passionate understanding of collective impact and what it truly means to implement as well as the um, the important elements that are required to implement the collective impact, impact approach and for sharing such a wealth of information with us. Um, thank you to everyone else in our audience for joining at the session. I hope that you found this information beneficial and please enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you for spending some time with us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Cheryl.
Thank you. Okay. Thank you.